types of waste do you produce daily? Trash, organic waste. Trash, organic waste. What happens to our waste? Goes to landfills. Can you ever throw something away? It's a weird thing, isn't it? Because you grew up, oh, you just throw it away, and there's this idea that away is gone. But it's not really gone, is it? So a lot of our waste, we produce enormous amounts of waste today. Um, the average American lives, it produces about two pounds of waste a day or something crazy like that. Um, much goes to landfill. Some ends up in the rivers and oceans. The amount of waste that an average individual is producing, do you think it's going up or down right now? You want to go with up? It may depend a little bit. Uh, it will depend a lot on the individual and what you purchase. But um, think about how much waste is just in our packaging of things. That's where most of our waste is coming from. So let's imagine you go to the store and you buy like a box of macaroni and cheese. What type of waste do we have there? Cardboard, Cardboard box. Mm -hmm. The packet that the cheese is in depending upon how lucky you are or not lucky, the plastic bag that the pasta noodles are in, the wasted food that you're not going to eat. Does something count as waste if it's going to get, like do we call recycling? We recycling do call recycling waste. waste. Okay. But that is one way that we reduce waste is through recycling, absolutely. Does waste injure wildlife? What percent of waste really do we think could be reused or recycled? Or composted or something like that? Throw out a number for me. What percentage? 80% of waste could be reused or recycled. Isn't that amazing? The town I was in in New Zealand like as a town had a really, really good recycling system and like and they diverted and composting, like they did that for everyone who lived there and they diverted like seventy percent of all the waste producer produced in the community didn't go to a landfill. Whose town has waste or has um whose town has garbage pickup? We'll start there. Everybody's. Whose town has recycling pickup? Everybody's. That's amazing. That's really good. Do they pick up everything with recycling? Anybody's recycling in their town pick up plastic bags? Mine is very clear that they will not take it. They will not take plastic bags. At the local supermarket, however, you can drop off plastic bags. Same with my house. Local supermarket will take as many plastic bags as you want to drop off. It's right by the entrance to the door. They won't take like the electronics and stuff. Correct. Electronic waste is a separate thing. You can't take it down to like, I don't know, Best Buy or something. Yeah. Sometimes. They will not take the massive old televisions though anymore. Those cost too much to recycle. So we'll start with bad news, shall we? We'll move to good. Anyone want to guess what we're looking at in picture B? I wouldn't call picture B part of the plastic island. Just plastic floating trash. Uh, what do we see in picture A? They have names. You were close, Matt. These are the Great Pacific Garbage Patches. Mm, because of what's called the gyre. So these are the swirling currents con concentrated in the center. Do you 
agree that waste is the cost of economic growth or the result of economic growth? We have more money, so we can have waste. Because if we had less money, would we waste as much as we do? Absolutely not. Well, like, I thought that people who live in, like, low incomes buy more disposable things. They may buy things that are not as long-lasting, yes. Yes. But, um, and let's imagine, let's compare the United States to people in, like, sub-Saharan Africa. Which group of people buys more disposable items? We do. Than they would. Um, just because we have the ability to do so. But it also means that we have in, in our economy the chance to make things much cheaper. But you're right that the average American, um, low-income American, is going to buy things that are more disposable. Because that's what they can afford. Can we be sustainable like this? No. We know it's not sustainable. We live in a high waste society and we produce way too much waste. I believe we talked about something called planned obsolescence before. Does anyone remember what that is? Pretty much the way something is manufactured or programmed, it's meant to be cycled out within the next three or four, maybe five years. I don't have mine in my pocket. Andrew, can you hold up your cell phone? How long will that last? You've had it three years? Mm -hmm. You have an Apple phone. Yeah. Does it charge well anymore? It's still alright, actually. I haven't updated it in a while. That might be why. Because Apple's getting in trouble for this, aren't they? Yeah. Uh -huh. our, your cell phone plans are based around this. Think about it. You re up every two years, you get a discount on a new phone. That's the way it's supposed to work. And depending upon how much they like you, I don't know, maybe it's just my carrier likes me and they think I will, think, think I will do this, every 18 months I can get a new phone. <laughs> and then what do I do with the old phones? I recycle them. Or you can donate them to domestic violence shelters or things like that, where they will reuse them for people as a free phone and they will get it on something where it can immediately call 911 with the press of a button. I'm like, that's a good use of my phone. But, oh, laptops, how long do they last? Four years? Yeah. Six years? Ten years? Anyone still have their calculator that they probably had since, like, middle school or something, though? Those things last forever for some odd reason. They use solar energy. Yeah, a lot of them do. And they still work, right? Um, how about jeans? How long do jeans last? A couple years? T-shirts? If we made them out of better quality material, they'd last longer, wouldn't they? So our items are not meant to last forever. Because if a company makes things that last forever, what happens to them? L.L. <laughs> Bean just changed their policy. Did anyone know this? No. They used to have a lifetime guarantee and oh, you could send go. things back. <laughs> now it's a one-year guarantee? What? Because they yeah. said they'd been losing a lot of money recently because people were sending them back things that were like 35, 40 years old that had been purchased at yard sales for replacement items. Because they were still honoring their policy. Jamsport backpacks have a policy where if you have a damaged backpack and you send it to them, they will send you a new one or repair it if they can. Um, the Totes Umbrella Company used to do the same thing. I don't know if they do anymore or not. And we already know about the concept of hidden costs, right? What costs are not in a computer or in a cell phone? What will be hidden there? The materials, the labor, the shipping, the mining, the marketing. Those are sort of built in. 
the environmental health effects of the areas where they are sent in order to be broken down or not. Where are computers usually broken down for recycling? Here or elsewhere? Abroad. There are countries that will buy our trash from us. They will buy our waste. And then they will have children working at breaking down our electronic waste to get the reusable portions out of it, putting those children's health at risk every single day. What's natural capital? So natural capital are the resources and ecological services that nature provides that help us to survive and help our economies. So these are our resources, solar power, wind power, hydropower, but this is also going to be the minerals, the fossil fuels, all of those things. Our natural capital is being degraded all the time. It's being depleted because it's being used, but it's being degraded because it's being made not as good as it was to begin. In 2005, the UN found that 60% of natural capital was had been degraded in the previous 50 years. World Wildlife Federation says the earth that we need to support the people we have today should be 1.3 times larger than it is now, and by 2035, earth should be twice as large in order to give everyone the natural capital they need and to provide the natural capital for the plants and animals that they need. So we're told we need to reduce our ecological footprint because human activity is putting a strain on the natural ecosystems. We're trying to do this. But wealthier countries have found a way to make it better where they live by exporting their waste to someplace else. This is looking at natural capital that's being degraded here. <coughs> you can see how we degrade it. And the last thing we're going to mention is solid waste. Solid waste has a very strange definition. How would you define solid waste? Or? All discarded waste that's not liquid or gas is solid waste. It doesn't necessarily have to be solid. It just can't be liquid or gas. Sludge that's like a mixture of solid and liquid counts as solid waste. So like sewage? Mm -hmm. uh, sewage kind of toes the line. At that point in time, it's both. Municipal solid waste is usually what we produce. <clears throat> from your homes and your workplaces, industrial solid waste, this is obvious, it comes from industries, e-waste, electronic waste. That sometimes contains some of our most toxic compounds. And we produce in the United States 25% of the world's solid waste. Do we have 25% of the population? I'm going to pick a couple things here to look at. Um, an aluminum can, how long does that take to break down? Eighty, you said? Keep going. Keep going. Five hundred years to break down an aluminum can. How long for those plastic six-pack holders from soda cans? Hundred. How about a plastic bag? Twenty. But here's the thing. Those two plastic things are going to break down into microplastics. They're not going to break down into things that are not problematic. They're going to break down into microplastics. Whereas the aluminum can is going to go back into aluminum particles, which are not toxic. So there's a difference then between decay and what you get from it. You guys mentioned hazardous waste. This is different. Hazardous waste, also toxic waste usually is a different term we use for it. 
Um, they mean about the same thing, but hazardous is something that puts you at risk. Toxin are things that are going to impact your health. But hazardous waste is going to have a threat to the human health or to environmental health. Maybe something is not hazardous to you, but it is hazardous to fish or to plants or to animals. Uh, for example, what do you guys use to kill mice or rats? Traps, cats, How about rat poison. Anybody? Probably not, because you all know it's hazardous, correct? Um, I recently learned about something that is non-hazardous to humans, non-hazardous to cats, and non-hazardous to dogs, that apparently is highly problematic and deadly for mice and rats. Are you ready for it? Vitamin D. High concentrations of vitamin D can be deadly. I don't know how it works. I don't know entirely how true it is, but it was one of those things where I was reading about better ways to control like your pest population. That was something they said. You can take vitamin D caplets and put those around. Your cat and your dog is less likely to take them, things like that. I don't know officially that it works, but they said it was a less hazardous way, which then makes me worry, okay, well, if it kills them, will it kill squirrels? How about tiny dogs? What makes a small dog different from a large rat um, when it comes to the biological load of, of chemicals? But hazardous waste tend to be outright poisonous, yeah. They're also chemically reactive, and this is one of the biggest problems with hazardous waste. This is one of the huge problems in Love Canal. You had a chemical soup, and these things together are going to react with each other, and then we have no idea what's going to happen. That's why we don't store hazardous waste items in pools together. They may, in fact, explode or become flammable. Hazardous waste tends to be corrosive or alkaline, perhaps, radioactive, um, spent radioactive fuel. Well, radioactive fuel, how many years approximately is it good for that we can use it to generate electricity from? Cody, the answer is not forever. Give me a year number. Um, it's just like, like what kind? Of, like green, like 235 or something? Like sure. That. Uh, it's like, isn't it like 25 to 50 or something like that? Most of our, our radioactive fuels are good for about four to five years mm. before they generate waste. They don't generate a ton of it though. And then they're no longer the high quality. So they might last as lower quality for longer. The left canal is a massive concern about this. E-waste, is it hazardous? Absolutely. Um, E-waste, 80% of it can easily be recycled or reused. For um, example, many of you have, I think you all have a computer or an iPad or something like that. What can you recycle from a computer? Plastic shell? The glass, the metal, the wiring, things can be melted down, reused. Almost everything in there can be recycled. Maybe it can be reused. Has anyone had a computer part break and they've had something replaced? I know nothing about computers. What's in it that's hazardous? Battery is one. Um, they may contain lead, mercury. Um, they usually, for what's reusable, they contain small amounts of silver, gold, platinum, copper, and aluminum on top of your glass and your plastic, but it's the, the lead um, or the nickel cadmium, things like that that are in the batteries that are really problematic. And some do contain small amounts of mercury. They may have mercury switches or things like that in them. And I mentioned that our, most of our e-waste is shipped overseas, usually to Asia and Africa, which should be stripped down for recycling. It's not done here. And it is frequently done in areas where labor's cheap, regulations are weak, and there's not a whole lot in the way of protective gear for the people doing it. If you were going to be exposed to lead and mercury and things like that, what safety gear would you want to wear at minimum? Safety goggles? 
gloves, maybe a lab coat, breathing mask. Yeah, so you wouldn't be like hanging out in a building just ripping things apart with your hands, right? But that's what's frequently done elsewhere. Which makes then the recycling of our items potentially a justice issue. I mentioned last time that with a cell phone you can recycle it to a domestic violence shelter. Do you know that if you're getting rid of a laptop that a lot of missions organizations will take them and they will send them overseas to their mission areas that are elsewhere that don't have access to a laptop or to the schools and things where they're working um, because laptops are expensive. So getting a donation, it's a lot cheaper to just send that over and let somebody use it. So if you're looking for places to donate your laptops to, lots of mission area organizations and educational organizations will take them and it's a tax deduction then for you. Waste management and waste reduction. Mm. So we produce a lot of waste. You have three options of what you do with waste, really. Once it exists, you move it someplace else, you keep it where it is, but you find a way to reduce its impact, or you recycle it. That reducing impact, that can be a lot of different things. Um, one of the easiest things we do to reduce the impact of waste. Why do trash trucks stop every so often and you hear a lot of noise? What's happening? They're compacting the waste. That's one way we reduce the impact. By reducing the amount, by squishing it all down, you're reducing its impact. It's one way. Another way is that we bury it underground or we put it someplace else or we take it out to sea or we burn it. How many of you have driven that stretch in 95 right by the stadiums where it just <clears throat> smells nasty, where the trash incinerators are? There's an upside to the trash incinerators. There's way less going to landfills and they actually use the steam and the heat from that in order to produce a little bit of electricity. Anybody know what happens when you burn plastic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you reduce the impact by having less waste to care about on land, but you haven't completely done away with the impact. You've made it a different type of impact. So reducing impact may be coupled with moving it, where the impact is then in the atmosphere as opposed to on land or in the water. Recycling it, though, makes the most sense, doesn't it? Costs money. How can we produce less waste? Because that's our other option here. We're back to that same question of prevention or cleanup. Doing something with the waste is cleaning it up. But how do we prevent waste in the first place? Any ideas? No ideas at all. You buy in bulk because it's cheaper, but it also reduces your waste over a long period of time, doesn't it? Yeah. And like, I usually buy fruit and vegetables using like cloth bags instead of plastic bags. These cloth bags as opposed to plastic bags. That's an easy way to make a reduction. I guess like switching out disposable products for the Yeah, like when you like go to Starbucks, like take a, your own. Use a cup. Yeah. Um, I use a lot of glass bowls at home for like leftovers and things like that. Um, for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is when I heat things up, it's a lot safer to reheat things in glass than it is to reheat things in plastic. But another reason is that they last a lot longer. I was really lucky in grad school. We lived right down the street from a massive like outlet center that had a Pyrex outlet store. So I bought tons of Pyrex glassware and that's what I keep all of my food in. But it's safe, it's clean, I can stare, if you need to sterilize it, that's real easy, you just use some hot water. And it lasts tons longer than Ziploc containers. 
and it doesn't seem to draw or to break even regardless of how many times I drop things. But I made the switch in part because it's healthier for me to not reheat things in plastic. Because the plastic then leaches into your food. Um, which becomes evident if any of you have those Ziploc containers that you've reheated multiple times and they have like that scorched mark around the edge. Does anybody buy less stuff than they otherwise would? Because that's another way to produce less waste, is to buy less stuff. But we are part of a uh, economy, uh, society, that equates stuff with good and with success. Have you seen the bumper sticker, He Who Dies With The Most Toys Wins? It used to be really big, um, and I don't know, like 10 years ago or something. And it was usually on, I'm not making any judgment calls because I have family members that own those really large lifted trucks. But it was usually on the bumpers of the guys with the really large lifted trucks who, once again, this includes my family members, like have multiple motorcycles and ATVs and things like that. So no judgment. I also love those people. But it was a really interesting thing. He with, who dies with the most toys wins. Do we think like this? Maybe not toys, but things. Any of you growing up, did your parents have like a policy that for every new pair of shoes that you got, one had to go? Or for every new toy that you got, one had to go? Some people do, and that's how they kind of manage it. Um, I'm kind of of the opinion that, yes, when I buy new clothes, it means I'm going to get rid of some and donate some because that's what I should do. Also, it makes my closet not full. Um, but my parents were definitely clear, okay, well, you want something new? That That's great. That's good that you want a new toy. Are you going to get rid of something? I have friends where that's where they operate with their children. They're only going to play with the toy for six months anyway, so we'll get fewer things and donate more. Integrated waste management allows us to use moving, reducing import, impact, and recycling all together without thinking about how do we produce less waste, but it allows us to mix how we handle waste. We believe that we start including how to produce less waste with this, like producing less packaging. We could intentionally decrease our waste by between 75 to 90%, especially if we did composting. There are different priorities as to how we can handle waste reduction and different things that people can do. We have things your producers can do, the consumers and waste management. <coughs> For example, your producers can find less harmful substitutes for what they're using. Your industries can do a lot of this. One of the companies that has been strangely on board with this is the 3M company. They've made substitutions almost everywhere else they can, everywhere they can in their manufacturing process for using things that are less harmful for multiple reasons. One is for the health of their employees. A second is usually because in the end it ends up being cheaper. And the third is they're not producing toxic waste. Um, anyone have a car company that prides themselves of being landfill free? Subaru. Does that increase your opinion of Subaru as a company? Would it make you more likely to buy a Subaru? For most people, it probably would. And that's the thing, one of the things that producers get from this is they get that notoriety, potentially, of being a good company, doing good things. But when you make a product more durable, you may lose money because people aren't going to continue buying it again and again and again. As a consumer, you can repair and reuse things. You can recycle things. Waste management can treat waste to make it less harmful. Incinerate solid waste, which gets rid of the waste problem, does not perhaps get rid of the air pollution problem, but those are separate problems. This is looking at integrated waste management. 
which is using a whole lot of different approaches. With it, we're setting things for recycling, for composting, yes. But you can also do hazardous waste management, industrial waste, those things separate. Construction waste includes a lot of hazardous waste. Solvents, paint strippers, paint thinners, paints, all of those things can be considered hazardous waste. What do you think construction sites do with what's left at the end? One option is you put it in a dumpster and send it to a landfill. You may have to separate out your chemicals from your wood waste and things like that. Do you know that Habitat for Humanity, except for their restore stores where they sell things, um, they will accept construction things that you have portions of cans of paint and things like that. You can actually go there and buy things that have been bought for construction but not used. Um, the one near my house would have windows and doors and appliances and things where they were either brand new or almost new that have been taken out of construction homes. Tons of paint cans with like a swatch of the color painted on the lid. So you only need a part of a gallon of paint. You can just go there and pick whatever one you want. So there are ways to get construction and potentially industry involved in this. Many industries are looking at how many times can we reuse our hazardous items over and over? And can we use our solvents multiple times for things before getting rid of them because it saves them money? in buying the solvent, but it really saves them money in getting rid of their waste. And eventually things will end up in the landfill or the incinerator when there is no place else. Which is this next idea, reduce, reuse, recycle. You learned this when you were in elementary school, correct? With the little triangle shape with the little <laughs> arrows, which it basically comes down to consuming less, using something more than once, and taking something and making it into another product. How do we get people, how do we convince people to, reducing is potentially the hardest. How do you convince people to reuse items? <laughs> sure, how do we do that? What do Whole Foods, Target, a couple of the other stores do when you bring your own bag? Or some other stores will charge you yeah. for plastic bags now. And one of the stores near me, it's a quarter a bag. Um, so you give them either a discount for reusing or you charge them for not reusing is a kind of like the two-pronged approach there. We've also found that it works to ban things as well. Um, plastic bags, single-use beverage containers, and straws have been banned in a lot of places. Uh, Finland, Denmark, Prince Edward Island, a number of cities in the United States. Straws are not available at any of the national parks, I don't think, in the United States. Um, and a lot of other places because you can recycle straws and people don't. I generally choose to recycle a straw if I I'm using one because I can, um, but that's something people, oh, it goes in the trash. Some people don't know that you can recycle straws. Ziploc has even put on their boxes to remind people that their bags are recyclable. And their boxes, a lot of them are now made of like post-consumer recycled paper <clears throat> and some of their items are made from recycled plastic. So we're seeing more work by companies as well to convince people to get on board. It's usually cheaper to make something from recycled materials and it takes way less raw material, which makes it better for the companies if we're recycling. Recycling one ton of aluminum cans saves 1,700 gallons of gasoline that would be used otherwise to extract the raw aluminum. That's amazing. And did you know that your can or your can contains almost as much aluminum as that pull tab on the top does? Um, 
it's kind of crazy to think about, but it's a really thick piece of aluminum at the top. Ronald McDonald House and a number of other charities will collect the pull tabs and they recycle them to get money back to support their charitable work. Any of you ever check out the free cycle websites or the free section of Craigslist for items you can get for free? It's pretty amazing things that people will put for free. It includes everything from furniture to the sheer number of pianos that are available at any given time for free on these things are insane. Um, but sometimes equipment, I mentioned to a couple of you, I don't know if I mentioned to everybody, the way my grad program handled when students move out. Did I mention this? We would usually send an email around when people were leaving because people left at all different times. In a graduate program, people leave when they get a job or when they graduate, and everybody rarely graduated at the same time. But we would send around an email, I'm moving out, these are the items that I have. And people would come and they would buy it from you or take it or whatever. Um, and we could also leave anything furniture-wise that we didn't need or we didn't want, and they would use it for incoming students. So um, I sold off my microwave, my toaster oven, um, most of my pots and pans, the silverware, um, the, gosh, I don't know what number person I was that had that reclining chair in my living room, but it had been there for like a good 15 years. Um, my bureau, my dresser, things that I didn't need and that I wasn't going to be moving, I just either gave or sold to current students or left for the next set of students. And it was encouraged that we did that. University of Delaware has usually the weekend before graduation each semester on main campus a pickup for anything that you want to donate to, and they usually have it again the weekend after graduation, anything you want to donate to the local Salvation Army or charities. Um, that way we don't ever have from there mini fridges, coffee pots, clothes, bed linens going out in the trash. A student tried to get that started here a few years ago and got no traction at all. Such a part of the culture of going out and jumping in the dumpsters for... Right, that was part of it. There was one semester I was teaching this course, a student went out and she sent an email around like during finals week, hey guys, I just rescued four mini fridges from the dumpster, does anyone want one? They're all in my room. She also got like six coffee pots and a whole, and she was like, they were sitting out next to the dumpster. So I took them and I'm going to give them to other people. Who doesn't want a mini fridge for free that was still functional? We expect the U.S. could recycle between 60 to 80 percent of our municipal solid waste, and we don't. So if we produce seven pounds of trash a day and we could reduce we could recycle 60 to 80% of it, we could recycle like five of those pounds of trash a day. Composting, anyone compost? Anyone wish they could compost? Anyone want to compost but their parents comment that it is way too smelly to allow them to do it? Elizabeth. Those of you who compost, is it smelling? If you're doing it well, it doesn't smell. <clears throat> Do you have a little thing like this? No, I just have like a ditch in the ground. Yeah. Ditch in the ground. <laughs> Anyone keep it in a trash can? Like a fence around ours. Fence around yours? We just chuck it in the chicken coop and then just throw it around every now and then. And then at the end of the year, we'll just like scoop it up in a tractor and pour it on our garden. Perfect. Yeah. How well do the plants in your garden grow? It's pretty good, yeah. Because like before that, my parents would like spend money on like lime and stuff to like try and like fix the soil, and like it's just worked a lot better. But, like they have like chicken manure, uh, pine chips from the bedding, and then like all the vegetables and fruits and stuff. So that brings a really good point. <clears throat> we don't just put food matter in compost, do we? That's where most people where they have a smelly compost issue have a problem, is all they put in is food, waste. What else do you put in? You mentioned wood chips are in there. Yeah. <clears throat> Chicken manure. Yeah. Um, we just do like stuff that's edible to them. So it'd be fruits and vegetables and we put eggshells in there too. What else do you put in yours? 
dead for you to pay you know, DR clippings. Yeah, things. absolutely. Yeah, we use that for like in between the rows of plants for like weed control. Mm -hmm. Anything else you put in yours? We eat a lot of vegetables, so we have a lot of like, you know, the little stubs or whatever that we throw in there. Some people will put newspaper in if they don't think that there's enough non-food yeah. matter in there because that will actually help to increase different types of bacteria and increase surfaces for bacteria to grow on to break things down. And it increases the non-green organic matter that's in there. Grass clippings are a great thing. Um, our, since I've been little, my dad um, has always felt that when he's so our leaves, we never put out leaves at the curb. We always composted our leaves in our gardens over the winter. It provided protection for the ground and they would break down into the summer or in, by the spring and summer and you would have fertilizer on your on your um, plants from the leaves breaking down. He also did the same thing with the lawn clippings. They would go in the gardens or he would mulch them back in to the yard because he felt it was better than throwing it away. Really, it was because he didn't like putting out trash cans full of leaves and grass. He felt bad about doing that because this is stuff that can degrade in our yard and add back to the soil fertility. Now, I, my town is a little wacky about things like chickens and um, composting. So I don't compost. I Also, the neighbors behind me don't keep their dogs in their yard. So any attempt that I would make at composting would lead to all of the food everywhere all over my backyard. So it's not ideal to compost out there. Just a little sad. Why is composting good other than it reduces your waste? It helps the soil. It helps the soil. It increases soil fertility, decreases soil erosion, increases water retention in the soil with all that organic hummus material, and it improves crop yields dramatically. What's one thing you don't want to put a lot, a couple things you don't want to put a lot of in your compost that Sarah doesn't have to worry about? Meat and animal fat are not the best things to go into compost. They attract different types of bacterial communities. They don't break down in the same way. And if you're putting them with your chickens, you're not going to feed them yeah. leftover bacon fat. There are like industrial composters, mm -hmm. though, that big, like bigger, like you wouldn't have at home or the bigger business would have. Absolutely. We visited a soup kitchen on a, a class, another class I was taking that had all the silverware that they used was compostable and mm. not waste and when they were done it's like they fed homeless people and then they had a huge industrial composter and all the food scraps and all the silverware could be composted and they can compost like animal yeah. products because it's like as long as you can as long as you cultivate the right bacterial community you can compost it so you might be wondering why do we not reuse and recycle as much as we could um and these are the three reasons that your book came up with i think um, either that or the reasons I came up with, or a combination thereof. The first reason um, is that most of the environmental costs are not included in a market price. This is pretty obvious. The environmental costs of your items are not included in your market price. Your bottle of water is a dollar or a dollar fifty. It doesn't include the cost of the really the breakdown products from the plastic. Second, we reuse and recycle. Uh, the reusing and recycling industries get fewer government subsidies than do your manufacturing companies. So it is not as monetarily good to reuse and recycle as much. The company is going to make less money. And the prices of recycled materials are not predictable. Items that are disposable are priced low by design. They just are. Extraction businesses get more government subsidies than do recycling <coughs> businesses, which is problematic. You would think probably, maybe you wouldn't right now, but in general, you would think that our government would probably use recycled paper, wouldn't you? Not so much. Why not? Well, because the price of recycled goods is not stable because the demand fluctuates. So recycled goods have a different price than do non-recycled goods. They also tend to cost slightly more at times or at times slightly less. And because of that lack of a stable price, we tend not to have them. 
However, we've passed laws now about e-waste. What do you do with your ink cartridges when they're empty? Tasha's sitting over there very sadly admitting that she puts hers in the trash. That's not what I do with mine, ever. Anybody? What do you do with them? Anybody refill them with those kits you can buy from, like, as seen on TV stores? I always want to try it, but they scare me. Did you know you can take them to Staples and you get $2 for them? If you have a Staples reward card, every time you buy ink, you can recycle up to five cartridges, and they will give you $2 in Staples reward bucks for them. And then Staples recycles them for you. They actually refill them. Like, yeah, I think Costco does refill them. Yeah. So you can get them refilled, but you can also recycle them. You just have to be, you just have to like hold on to them and then take them to Staples and recycle them. I recycle mine at Staples and I get money for it, which is amazing. But they've made it something that they do. One of the things we do with waste is we dump it and we bury it. And we got two kind of options on this. We have what you all fear are the open dumps. The open dumps are uh, open dumps are exactly what they sound like. You got a pit and you throw some things in it and you leave it open to the environment or you just pile it all on the ground. Totally open to the environment. 85% of dumps in China are open dumps. Here's a big problem. Water gets in, water mixes with everything and it seeps into the groundwater with anything it picks up. Also, you know, raccoons, animals, floods, wind, things can move things around. It is not confined. We don't do this here. We build sanitary landfills. There's usually a liner of some sort. The linings that we have here are multi-step linings. There's the concrete lining with the drain that collects what's called the leachate, which is whatever water is coming out that would otherwise leach into the soil. There's plastic liners. There's a plastic liner and a clay liner on top. And then we plant things on top of it, just usually grass to keep it all covered. Your waste is compacted before it's put on there. It's covered and it's isolated. It says it's about 70% of US waste goes there. 80% of the waste in Canada ends up at a place like that. Are there waste is usually incinerated. There are some pros and cons for your sanitary landfills. Um, they handle a large amount of waste, they don't produce a lot of odors, they have less environmental problems. You can build playgrounds on them or other things when you've covered them and with the way we handle them today as opposed to the way we handle them in Love Canal, that's fine. But um, they produce a lot of pollution, they smell bad, they encourage people to produce waste as opposed to reducing it because they give you a place to put it, and they can leak and contaminate groundwater. Okay. This is kind of like what they look like. So at the bottom, you have clay liners that are gonna keep anything from going into the groundwater. You have sand layers that collect the leachate with pipes that will pump it up to um, storage tanks where it will then be treated. You have a synthetic liner, either a polymer or some form of a plastic liner in between. And then you have your garbage, which on top of it, you end up with clay, sand, topsoil, and plant matter. There are wells that will take the methane gas out to keep it from <clears throat> concentrating, because if the methane gas concentrates, eventually our landfills could explode, and that would be bad. So in order to keep that from happening, we have methane venting areas. So you're getting rid of all of the byproducts through the leachate and the venting. And eventually, over time, the landfill decays and it will compact even more. Decent use of the land, right? Some of you were like, but we could use that land for better things like growing food or things. But it usually does end up with grass growing on top of it and some form of a recreation area near them. This is another look at a landfill, and in a lot of them, they do a daily cover of with earth, with, with soil, over top of what they've put in. It, they may remove it from day to day. Maybe it's not done every day, maybe it's done weekly. 
but it's really important to include soil back into this because a lot of your bacteria is housed in that soil and that's going to be with doing your breakdown. So you want soil and bacteria being integrated into your landfill. You convert it. Waste to energy incinerators are our main ones. The one I mentioned that we have here in Philadelphia. But these things don't turn good profits unless they burn a whole lot of waste. So this is going to encourage, once again, waste to be created by your average individual. They're good. They save land that would be used for landfills. They reduce the need for burning fossil fuels. And okay, that's good. Um, but they can produce harmful air pollution. They encourage waste production instead of recycling. And people don't like them because they smell bad. You can cut production of hazardous waste. This has become a necessity. And this is something we're doing fairly well at right now. Let's find out where we are. Industries um, are usually using an integrated approach where some things go to waste, some things get reused, some things get recycled, some things get reduced. It allows them to produce less waste. It allows them to convert to less hazardous chemicals. And it usually forces them to start doing long-term storage of things safely on site. They have found that industries, when pushed, can recycle or reuse most of the minerals and the chemicals that they use as opposed to disposing them. Not everything, but most things can be used multiple times. We are trying to go from industry the way we do it to the model that they want is industrial ecosystems. So where the waste from one company can become the starting product for another company and their waste goes someplace else. The idea that we have these integrated waste networks because, okay, you're producing something that's high quality material, you're gonna need really high quality solvents or really high quality chemicals. But a company down the line, they're not producing the same quality. Could they reuse your waste product that wasn't clean enough for your industry but is clean enough for their industry and so forth. We are calling these usually a resource. We'll do a little bit of waste next time. I think there were a couple articles or videos to look at. Definitely, if you haven't, you should, because I want to talk about microbes and mushrooms that can eat plastic, don't you? Did you know there are bacteria and mushrooms that can eat plastic? Also, this image here shows the industrial ecosystem from Kallenberg, Denmark. You can see that here the companies are producing less pollution and less waste because they're allowing their waste to become the resources of other businesses. We call this an ecosystem because you have some companies that are utilizing what would have been the waste of others, much like we see in the way ecosystems actually function. Not only is this good for the environment, but it helps owners because it allows them to save money. And this is termed a resource exchange system. You, if you look closely, you'll be able to see how the different waste is used in other businesses. And I wonder sometimes if something like this would work here in the United States. Hazardous e-waste is from the electronics that we waste and that we use every day. You all know that some of our items just don't, they're not made to last. That, that concept of planned obsolescence is very true in our electronic waste. The EU has banned e-waste from landfills and incinerators. This forces manufacturers to take the items back so they can be properly recycled. They also do have a recycling tax that is charged on the purchase of things, which allows for the monies to come back and be used in order to offset the cost of recycling. In the United States, we produce about 50% of the e-waste for the world, but we only recycle about 27% of it. We expect that about 80% of e-waste could probably be recycled. And in the United States, it's not our country that's leading with legislation and forcing legislation. It's the states and the towns who would otherwise have to pay the price of disposing of these materials. The problems with e-waste are multifold. Not only do we have planned obsolescence, but we have the rapid growth of the EE industry, electronic industry. It's also the fact that there are toxic metals like lead, like mercury in our electronics. 
and that those who are recycling or disassembling our electronics are put in hazardous working conditions. The best way to deal with e-waste is to prevent putting out into the environment in the first place. It's not cleanup. Hazardous wastes are wastes that are toxic, um, that compromise human or environmental health, and they can be detoxified, where the toxins are removed. This can be accomplished through physical, chemical, and biological methods, and we're gonna look at a couple of those in the next few slides. After the waste is detoxified, it can be buried for long-term safe storage. Sometimes we incinerate it. This won't work if it will improve, if it will produce dioxins as it burns. And if the toxic ash is left over, it must be later disposed of separately as hazardous waste. So some things are gonna become detoxified, others are gonna be incinerated to remove the toxins or reduce the quantity of toxins for the waste. We can do deep well injections for storing hazardous waste. It's exactly kind of what it sounds like, where you take the toxic waste and you inject it into the ground. It will end up going below all of the layers of aquifers that we draw our water from, usually gonna be encased by multiple layers of clay. This is pretty cheap as far as storage goes. It's safe if you choose the right site in this area with a lot of, without a lot of tectonic activity and things like that. The waste can sometimes be retrieved if necessary because you may be able to suck it back out through the methods in which you injected it. But the pipes can leak. Earthquakes and tectonic activity allow for problems. And like just about every way of dealing with hazardous waste, anything that allows us to clean it up really encourages the production of more waste. This is actually better, perhaps, waste reduction method than some of the next ones we're going to see. Having said that, burying and keeping waste on the surface really should be a last resort thing. These aren't things that we should go, oh, well, I should do those things first. No, there are last resorts. Waste reduction and detoxification are the much better ways so prevention. This is a surface impoundment in Niagara Falls. It's storing liquid hazardous waste. The water is evaporating and everything else is what we're left with. None of us wanna go swimming in there. You can see there's a lot of different things swirling around chemically. And these surface impoundments are ponds, pits, lagoons, areas where your water evaporates and concentrates your toxic waste. Your volatile organic compounds, your VOCs, will evaporate off. These generally have liners, or they're supposed to have liners, to keep groundwater safe. However, some of them were started before the regulations for this. Because of that, the EPA states that they expect 7 out of 10 surface impoundments do not have a liner, and that up to 90% of those have the potential of hurting groundwater supplies. These are fairly low cost, too. And they can be secure if you have liners, uh, but groundwater can become polluted and air pollutants can happen as things evaporate. Mercury and lead can't be destroyed or detoxified or safely buried. These are two compounds that we have a lot in our waste and really we're gonna need to change the way we handle them to reduce them, stop using them or find substitutes. The Resource Conservation and Recovery Act was passed in 1976. It was amended in 1984. It regulates about 5% of the hazardous waste that's produced in the United States. It allows companies permits for disposal of their waste. 5%. The other 95% is not regulated because it is far too expensive to regulate them. The um, detoxification, all of that costs a lot of money. CERCLA, I mentioned before, we're dealing with Love Canal. It's also called the Superfund Act. The CERCLA stands for Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. It's passed in 1980 and companies had to pay taxes 
if they produced toxic waste. These taxes would be used to clean up other toxic waste sites. Because of legislation issues, the tax was removed in 1995, and now big companies no longer fund it, the taxpayers do. The Superfund Act's job was to identify and clean up hazardous waste sites. And in the first five years, only 13 sites were cleaned up, but by 1999, over 600 sites had been cleaned up. And companies can now be held liable for their waste forever. The Basel Convention was um, passed in 2011 and it banned the shipment of hazardous waste from our more developed countries to our less developed countries. It was ratified by 170 countries worldwide, but not the United States, and then also not places like Afghanistan and Haiti. So um, it's a problem. It doesn't mean that we don't abide by it, but some of our hazardous waste, particularly electronic waste, does go overseas. In fact, some of the LDCs actually buy it from us. Maybe not from our government, but from companies within our borders. So what if we don't wanna produce more waste? What if we wanna produce less? One of the best ways to produce less is actually to include environmental costs into the market price or to deal with taxes and potentially to consider rewards for how businesses do work better. You hopefully remember the concept of full cost pricing from the beginning of the semester. This is where you work in the environmental cost for an item. Sometimes it results in job creation and profits at first, other times it doesn't. Um, it's gonna depend on whether or not you can easily set a full cost pricing and if that's gonna create then a market for recycling. We could switch to lower impact goods and services though. Instead of getting a new cell phone or new ink cartridges, maybe we could pair our cell phone screens or refill our ink cartridges. Alternative products are products that are not as toxic. They generally have a higher cost, um, but because of that, it usually reduces our consumption of them and we're a lot better with how we use them. The creation of alternative products will increase job creation and it will help a lot of your greener businesses. For taxing, we could tax polluters and tax those who produce a lot of waste or tax everyone based on the amount of waste and types of waste that they create. We could change the tax subsidies and tax breaks. We could reward companies that are environmentally friendly and where the environment um, is better because of them, the companies that detoxify things as opposed to creating storage ponds for storing them. And that would allow then these companies that may be more expensive or these methods that may be more expensive of cleaning things up to actually become cheaper because the tax subsidies would offset the price. Additionally, we should sell services instead of selling things. When I mentioned at the beginning of this slide, the idea of fixing cell phones, it's difficult to fix your cell phone screen. It can be difficult to fix your laptop screen. Instead, just replace the entire thing. However, that's not really environmentally friendly. It's not perhaps a good job, a good idea, but it tends to be what we do. Maybe instead of selling things, though, we should look at this concept of selling. This is showing you some businesses and careers that should grow as we shift um, wait, high waste economy. How do we better store waste? How do we better deal with waste? How do we go about reducing waste? The easy thing to do is shift from, uh, from, not for, shift from a high waste to a low waste economy like that. Consumption, efficient use of resources, and less hazardous alternatives. Maybe you can find a way to be sustainable. Reduce your use, reduce your consumption. Or maybe we have fewer people? And that allows us to be more sustainable too. We talked about this in class and I'm gonna 
apologize if this recording isn't from class. Somehow the last few slides um, got cut off. And well, I'm there.